noticed that with most of my videos, I've been pretty positive. But I feel I might have been too positive. Reality always bites, and everyone is bound to have a chip on their shoulder. And everyone's got a character that they just utterly abhor and wants them beaten to a bloody pulp and ripped to shreds. And it just comes to show that misery loves company. Now keep in mind, I'm not going to include characters I love to hate. These are the ones I just flat out despise. You know something's gotta give sooner or later. I was going to reach a top 15, but I'm going to let Logan handle that. And I limited it to just the usual 12. It's too angsty for 10 entries anyway. Before we begin, if you happen to like any of these characters, then kudos to you. I appreciate the civil fans. Those who aren't, prepare for a world of hurt. I'll be as salty as the Dead Sea, so prepare yourselves, and hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. It is time to end this. Bullshit! Let's begin this hate fest with a unique entry on the road less traveled, Rumble Roses. Remember in the first game, Reiko was the main protagonist. She was the champion of the Rumble Roses tournament, succeeding her mother in searching for her missing older sister. So, who was the main antagonist and responsible for all those tragic calamities? Anesthesia, aka the Dark Nightingale. She in itself reminds me so much of the other evil nurse, Gina Lambert in Sleepy Hollow. How so? I'll tell you. She's the sinister covert scientist of the first game. Her purpose? To fill the world with fear and suffering as she collects many beautiful and skillful women as test subjects to make her ultimate weapon for the military, Lady X. As the name implies, she pretty much collects and alters the bodies and minds from her day subjects, even brainwashes them for her own warped ends. Many of Rico's acquaintances have suffered from her alone, and it soon revealed that the mad maid scientist was the culprit in having Rico's sis disappear in order to create her most prominent pet, known simply as Evil Rose. She definitely shows the meaning of a covert narcissist, being completely emotionally detached through the foul treatments during her research. Even scarier since she happens to be a nurse numbing their pain, while also using them to afflict pain on others for her own gain, while also utilizing them, Lady X, and Evil Rose as weapons of war. Good thing Reiko overthrown her toxic machinations. Interesting thing to note, she also creates the fighter's heel face forms. Alternate personas of each combatant. Heck, Dr. Cutter is more ruthless and lesser calm than her original counterpart. She kind of reminds me of Doragon in the Bouncer, hellbent on destruction and utilizing and cloning numerous subjects as weapons, androids, and degrading their minds. The reason why she's low is because... Hmm, while she's a terrifying villain, especially with her bone-chilling theme song, she is an interesting villain. And let's face it, the sequel was piss poor for the most part. Anesthesia, nevertheless, will always be a loathsome abomination of nature. Doesn't take a scientist to figure that out.
Another lesser-known villain on this list is Hala the Accuser from the Guardians of the Galaxy. Nah, not the Squeenix game. I'm talking only about the Telltale series. The game alone is contrary to the convoluted MCU, hence my interest in it. And Hala, I'd say, is even more competent than other Kree villains like Ronin and others combined. She's the power-hungry and obsessive Kree whose mission was to use the Eternity Forge to revive her lost clan by Thanos. Even her own son, Bao Din. She was the one who stalked Star-Lord and his team as they took the artifact from Thanos and stole it for herself. Hala is one of the most calculative, hellbent villains Marvel has ever made, even rivaling Galactus, Doctor Doom, and Thanos. And her maniacal perseverance can even rival that of Ganondorf and Bowser to be put to shame. She was the one orchestrating all those tragic and enemy ambushes, always outmaneuvering the Guardians at every minute, and even forming fractures into the team's infrastructure. As Peter takes the forge to the ruins of planet Dronbino, a dilemma was made as to whether or not to destroy it, as it's capable of bringing back people from death. After being pressurized by the team, he soon decides to destroy it rather than activate it, causing some strain. And Hala never caring for the welfare of others either raises her undead army, or absorbs the power and destruction of the forge itself, making her the most powerful psychotic in existence. The extreme massacres can even make Onaga impress, killing millions in order to revive her long-lost Kree army. Once the revived Guardians and Mantis reunite and put an end to Hala's schemes, I prefer her zombie son killing her instead be brought to Nova Corps justice, with the powers of the Infinity Forge drain out of her. She was such a terrifying, deadly, and overall abhorrent villain, which foreshadowed my encounters with other evildoers on the list. Regardless, Hela will always be the walking nightmare of tyranny and never-ending destructive desires. For once, I actually agree with Oscar on something. I, too, hate Cranky Kong from the Donkey Kong series. And just his name alone is sour enough, even worse than any name of the Seven Dwarves. Believe it or not, his real name is actually Donkey Kong, the first. Ever since his debut in the arcade classic and the revelation as the first Donkey Kong, I always despised that greedy, lazy geezer. Ever since I was a kid, I always hated how he mistreats and abuses his family. The egotistical geezer first kidnapped Pauline, and always became the tyrannical barrel thrower to his arch-rival Mario, aka Jumpman. It's no wonder stated in Smash Bros that Cranky's been a bitter rival to him, much like how Scorpion is to Sub-Zero. After that, the roles were reversed as he got captured and relied solely on his first son, Donkey Kong Jr., in order to save him and overthrow Stanley. And he just drags in his son's welfare on multiple occasions, willingly putting his baby in crisis! How much of an abusive dad can he possibly be? Fast forward to Donkey Kong Country, where I first encountered him. That abusive ape loves to hit his grandson and grandnephew in the noggin with his cane, even when he tries to give them... repetitive advice. He certainly loves obsessing over those asinine old man tropes. Then in Donkey Kong Country 2, Tonky gets captured by Captain K. Rule as payback, and Diddy and his girlfriend Dixie woke up to find him missing. And Cranky stays in his new cabin like a weak hermit charging you for him to give advice. I'm saving his own grandson. You're poor, give me some damn banana tokens. 
Even Wrinkly is a better mentor than you. Yet still, both relatives get captured and he spends his time in a carnival run by Swanky, charging Dixie and her cousin Kitty for even more money to progress and insult you when you lose. Shame on you since you were fit all that time and never lifted a damn foot till now. Even worse in Donkey Kong 64 when he doesn't fucking care about the welfare of his wife, who's been a deceased spirit, and still ridicules the family for no reason. And finally the retro games where he uses a pogo stick like Uncle Scrooge, even though he lied to us on being too old and frail, and crippled to do the deeds himself. Even Scrooge may be greedy, but he surpasses you in every asset. Cranky is the most double-crossing member and leader of the Kong clan, and he never cares for his own family he leads and abandons his own son, never to be seen again. He's a backstabbing, greedy, selfish, manipulative, and overall neglectful geezer who sours his own surname. I wish the roles were reversed with Wrinkly, and I wish he died from a heart attack or a stroke before the next game. Well, I can sum him up in one word, even to those turncoats I had in the past. This is one of the first of a few damsels in distress that I absolutely hate. This trope alone just makes my blood boil, and I feel it's repulsive for all women from gaming and otherwise. One of those ridiculous girls behind this cliché is Amy Rose from the Sonic series. That's right, just like Phoenix King, I absolutely abhor Amy Rose. Have no fear! Rose is here! That stalker of Sonic always gets under my skin. Ever since her debut since Sonic CD, she's become one of the most irritable characters Sega conceived, much like Bowser Jr. in Mario Sunshine. She follows Sonic everywhere he goes due to her obsession on him being the free-willed hero. In fact, he always turns down her annoying advances the moment they happen. Whether it be the Sonic Adventure games, Sonic 06, and many, many others. Hell, it's always hilarious how much that fangirl suffers when she confronts him. The reason why she's lower is because I love how Amy becomes a Karen and throws a conniption fit. And she had only one good moment in her role in Sonic Adventure, always convincing and helping Gamma. But that's really it. Other than that, she's a spoiled brat similar to others on this list, and I always despise the excruciating pretty and pink princess cliché. Princess Celise was so freaking close to be on the list, but thankfully, she was only in Sonic's Dark Ages, and Big is... so-so. But that pathetic girly girl was intolerant enough to be on here. And Sonic in himself is asexual and the anti-Mario anyway. So Amy was just one of the dandles that we can just do without. It was hard enough to get through the Code Lyoko series, and despite its insane amount of episodes, William Dunbar was definitely one of those reasons. If there's one type of person I wish they'd be rid of, it's definitely turncoats. And Will is the personification of just that. He was a new intern in the Kadok Academy and was fast friends with the Lyoko Warriors. After a while, he became the love stealer as he obsesses over Yumi, who actually had her heart set out for Orc. 
William was certainly a desperado creating that love triangle between the original couple. Soon afterwards, specifically when the Fall of Xanax game was released, William was then brainwashed by the viral overlord. Kinda reminds me on how Agent Smith wounded Bane in the Matrix Reloaded and corrupted his mind. I'm sure Xana did the exact same thing, and the Matrix plots were inspiration of Lyoko's later plots. Seems like that to me. William would usually be seen riding a manta ray and attack the heroes. And worst of all, he sucks at battle. He's a glass cannon and always hides himself behind waves of Xana's other infestations. And no one outside of Lyoko knows the wiser on William's peculiar actions. And he still attempts to steal Yumi's heart. And if anyone resists him, steals their lives. And the more progressive the series is, the longer William's treachery. Even more than Sindel's. And the series itself is so extensive, it goes on for a damn eternity! Whenever I should see him, I want to destroy him right then and there. He's a maniacal person infected by Xana. He's a broken, desperate teenager much like Riku starving for a girl's love. He's a weak, incompetent tool of destruction that I just wish he'd be decimated already! I feel so much like Matrix on how he is into viruses. There are so many characters that are abhorred in the Zelda series, some more hateable than others. First off, I do not hate Navi nor Kebra Gebra, as they always try to help, and I don't find these as annoying as 98% of gamers. You'll see why on the former in my petites list. They may seem prominent, but I never found them sufferable. Ingo, Tingle, Skull Kid, Tattle, and Tail were so damn close to being on the shit roster. But one that irritated me the most was Baby Princess Rudo. Yes, I heard she kicked ass in Hyrule Warriors, but I never cared. Anyway, ever since her debut in my favorite installment, she was a brat at first sight. First of all, when Link visited Sora's domain, he received word and worry of its missing heir. He soon finds a bottle with Rudo's letter in it. And as soon as you encounter her inside Jabu Jabu's belly, she looks very stern. And she straight up gets pissy as soon as Link mentions he's trying to save her. Not to mention she wanted to be swallowed as she's looking for Zora's sapphire, which the whale swallowed. I don't believe when she said she'd been there when she was young. If she was, won't she know her way around already? Well, apparently not since she falls into deep trouble and always gives a hissy fit whenever you leave her for the other rooms. She then chastises you for that calling you inconsiderate and to take responsibility, even when she's in a safe place. She's such a lazy asshole, never helping you at all, and just functions as a lousy paperweight to hold down switches and shit. And she's so careless, always wandering into danger, putting yourself in harm, chasing after her. She soon demands you to throw her up to a spiky platform where the big octo awaits you. She's so careless that she never bothered to, I don't know, bail? Thankfully, you don't see her the rest of the way, until you clear out the belly as you decimate the baronade. But that immature ingrate lies to your face and taking too long. I was busy saving your fucked up hide and Hyrule, damn it! And you know what's worse? Link doesn't even know till later that Precious Sapphire was an engagement ring. Like the Nether Realm, if I should be married to you, you little twit. It was a puzzle piece to save Hyrule, which was a setup 
and Zoras can't be compatible with a single human. Like a mermaid to a man. And they say Navi is even worse. It's through those bitter experiences that left me a hard first impression that it completely overshadowed her productive role in Hyrule Warriors. To the point on being good for only one other purpose. Fried frog legs, anyone? It was easy, but also conflicting to choose a loathsome representative in the Star Fox series. And no, I'm not one of those usual gamers who despise Slippy. While his voice was irritating in 64, he became more tolerant after that. And if it weren't for him, the team would never know the enemy shields nor have awesome inventions. Throughout my whole life, I had hated two characters. I was either going to pick Falco or Pigma, as I despise them both even to this day, and I very much agree with Logan on the latter. They're bullies, one's a hothead, and the other is a greedy piece of whipped pig skin. But there was one other that wounded me just as badly at the start of my adulthood. The Borg riffoffs themselves and the big bads in Star Fox Assault. These viruses in the outer part of the Lilac system are certainly worthy of the word infestation. They're scary bastards that are bug-like, similar to cockroaches, who invade and ruin every life form imaginable, whether it be organic or mechanical. Possessing them and soon reducing them into mindless slaves serving their own volatile purposes and infecting others in their wake on going by the bidding of their accursed queen. The Aperoids are much like the X-Parasites in Metroid, both mind-altering and psych-altering, disguising themselves and manipulating others into playing their minds and emotions like marionettes acting as their fallen prey or simply luring them to serve their disgusting whims. And yeah, I said it. They are indeed clones of the Borg from Star Trek, especially after the next generation in Voyager. They always have the same mannerisms that resistance is futile, they're vain of themselves, and think others outside of their collective as inferior. They always prime themselves as the perfect life forms, which they're not. They're capable of manipulating everything and everyone without relent, and function as drones and jobbers to their cause with the hive mind to boot. The only difference is that they're insectoids and part of a Star Fox game. Nothing more. In case you don't believe me, then allow me to elaborate. I encountered Star Trek particularly first contact a few weeks before I came across those abominations. And I'd seen some episodes revolving around the Borg, like the finale of Voyager, and Data's and Locutus's corruption. So I know firsthand on the matter. The Aperites are copycats of the Borg, and they're quite inferior themselves. And they're just as bland after a while as the rest of the emotionless cast. I can write a whole rant on how pathetic the salt was, and the Aperites certainly took the cake and mutilated it. I'd wish there'd be a spirit or a whole legion of them who would blast those asinine aperoids, especially the queen, from the inside out. God damn it, that was a terrible idea for a villain. No wonder this was my ending point in the series. Picking an obscene Mario character was definitely bound to happen, whether it be Bowser Jr., the Shrooms, or even... No! I don't hate Toad like the majority of consumers! I already explained that in my petites list. Instead, 
The heavy crown goes to Princess Peach Toadstool. Considering I'm a tomboy and I'm not the biggest fan of magical girls, girly girls, or princesses, Peach has certainly made my love sour as the fruit. That hapless damsel was the earliest hateable character I ever encountered, always being in another castle, per se. Even Disney princesses had nothing good on me. Aside from her minor role in Mario Bros. 2, it was too damn common on having beautiful women be captured on a constant basis and hardly have the chance to fend for themselves. And even if she does in Smash in particular or Mario Kart, she's a paper cup. Peach is hardly an action girl, always having the lousy Danzel Dragon cliché being captured by Bowser, Count Black, and even the spoiled brat Bowser Jr. And always being saved by Mario in every single game concocted. And keep in mind, she was indeed the first ever Nintendo Royal who started this asinine cliché, even sooner than Zelda herself. With every game I played growing up, it was to the point because of her, in which I despised princesses. No joke. As I always hated women always being objects of just beauty and helplessness, instead of being strong and independent like Samus or Katana. It was thanks to them which restored my esteem from all the psychological damage that Peach caused. It was also the fucked up element that was abused to death with Princess Elise and Sonic the Hedgehog, and Sonic is supposed to be asexual and the anti-Mario. And to hear that high-pitched cutesy voice is like nails on a chalkboard. Not the more epic voices you would hear in other media. If there's any princess from Mario I turn to, it's always Daisy, the love interest of my favorite character, Luigi. It just makes other underrated entries like Toad, Waluigi, Birdo, and others look like saints compared to her lazy stereotypes and incompetence. Sure, there was a Super Princess Peach and her debut game coming up, but my resentment for her alone made me have a permanent change of heart. And beauty is pretty much the eye of the beholder if you don't have actions to back it up. My disposition has subsided a little since she had a more productive role in very few entries like the Mario movie, Super Mario RPG, which will later be remastered for the Switch, the Super Mario Bros. Super Show series in which Deke does a hell of a job, and I'm sure there are some good cosplayers in the new amusement parks. But nevertheless, Peach will always be a curse and damnation to princesses in my book. Out of all the disgraceful characters in the colossal franchise called Final Fantasy, there was one that stood out like a bloody spear. Shantoto, Seymour Butts, Ject, Kefka, Cosmos, Chaos, Sin, the racist Waka, Bartha Dillis, Sefi, whom you know I hate with the fiery passion of a thousand suns, and especially the Manettes who dodged a fucking bullet. Just like another abhorrent character, this one made my blood boil when I was little, and that is the backstabbing, high-jumping dragoon, Kane Highwind. While he was cool to play as with his jump ability and was a bromancer to Cecil, the sky was certainly not the limit. He has literally soiled my all-time favorite installment. After being separated in the Village of Mist, Gobe snuck onto him and made him as his mind slave. The hatred all started as Cain beat the piss out of Cecil and betrayed all of Abul by stealing its precious wind crystal, while letting Rosa get abducted. That stoic traitor only wanted Rosa for himself and never Cecil, and he inspired Riku's dark, obsessive ways. Cain was actually aware of it all 
just for the sake of being a love stealer, mole, and a fucked up friend to Cecil. He may have been the informant, but that's no excuse of his dissonant serenity, nor his snake duality. Actually, let me take that back on Gobez manipulating him. Cause he actually did this twice! As soon as you leave the sealed cave and attain to the last door crystal, Gobez is the crafty chess master made Kane as his stooge stealing it and conspired to reunite all the world's crystals and awaken the destructive giant of Babel. Only this time, he admitted to my doing mind it. It's my own again. I cannot expect forgiveness, but. Forgiveness? It's your fault the giant appeared in the first place! Me! Yeah, that's right! I never played the Game Boy Advance nor PSP versions, so I never had the chance to get rid of that Kane love stealing lookalike. So it was a bitter taste when I had to use him to slay Zeromus. But the nightmare didn't cease there. In Dissidia Duodecum, Kane hatched a conspiracy plan with his Puppet of Light in order to put all heroes to sleep until awakened in the next cycle with the ever-duplicating mannequins. Instead of finding the source of the problem like Laguna did, Kane just wanted to betray each one and stab them in the back, to have them incapacitated till the round is over. How stupid is that? If he accidentally kills someone by doing this, and it's retarded on its own since if there's a massive restart, won't there be a repeat of the mannequin threat itself? If anyone, it should be him that should perish, which he later did. Kane is also so damn arrogant to every threat in every iteration. And people say he is a badass? More like a badass that should bleed! Everyone praises this double-crosser, even though I tried to redeem slightly in my Final Fantasy fix. I just want him and his bloated ego cut down to size. Sure, he may have helped Seodor, but it is nothing compared to the irate insanity I had to put myself through. Since I was actually four! His main theme is suspicion, which is always a bad sign. It's no wonder he is the Biblical King's distant descendant. He ain't soaring high with his two-toned soul being tainted and laden by lead. When it comes to Pokemon, there is a shitload of those pocket monsters as well as trainers the series concocted. Ash, Giovanni, Basculin, Alamomola, Stunfisk, the ugly Braxish, Love Disk, and even the hot-headed Charizard at times. But one has been a constant source of resentment in every aspect of this particular Pokemon. Execute! There is still the Evolution Executor, which is admittedly better, but those six seeds, that's right, seeds, not eggs, are downright deplorable. It all started in the putrid anime episode when they've been raised by a bum magician named Melvin. You know, the infamous episode in which the Desperado and his six tet hypnotized Ash just cause they lacked the talents and soon let loose a raging herd of Executor? Yeah, that irritating incident. Personally, I wish for Officer Jenny to arrest those lowlifes and scorch them with a Growlithe, cause they're nothing but double trouble worse than Team Rocket. Aside from their despicable roles, they made me hate its concept. They're seeds, not eggs so their species and name is rather deceiving. They always travel in six, which can be aggravating in itself to lose even one of them. I also saw them in a negative manipulative light ever since, and whenever I should see their ugly, fragile shells, I wish to incinerate them to a mount of ashes instantly. 
and they were simply one of those spammy pesky psychic types to deal with in all the broken Gen 1 games. Even those that are used in Stadium! Despite all those flaws and disturbing experiences, the Execute certainly gave us a blessing since those powerhouses destroy themselves. And it's a grass and a psychic! Thank Arceus for Gen 2 and the Dark Types! Just like Ruo, if they were classified as eggs, I see them as good for food, like the scrambled or deviled eggs. That is what Execute should be good for! As a huge fan of the F-Zero series, I had mentioned on multiple occasions of the various hateable characters. Whether it be Jody Summer, Michael Chain, Treacherous Truman from the anime, Miss Killer, and even Black Shadow and Deathborn's poor portrayals. But one in particular, a maniac that existed for a century and a half had always made the cut. In conjunction being my favorite pilot's arch nemesis and murderer. And that without a doubt is... <laughs> this mutated python of radiation has always been the source of hatred in F-Zero. Not just the dominant female Jody Summer. But much like her, Zoda's chaotic reputation all started in the anime and the game's based from it. It all started in 2004, and how he was an escaped convict, that after robbing a bakery, Rick confronted him and put him behind bars, until he had his golden opportunity and made a cunning maneuver that made the door of his getaway car hit Rick directly and rendered him near death for 150 years. And this incident scarred Haruka, which made her just as maniacal as she went on a killing spree and chased him to the East Bank, where she never had a chance to kill him and were still frozen and then exiled. 150 years later, they were both awakened by Black Shadow, though he mutated him with a dark reactor might, hence his hideous appearance. Since then, much like the poster boys in Mortal Kombat, Zoda and Rick always had a never-ending feud, with my favorite guy harnessing these tragic losses thanks to him alone. I can surely relate to him, because I too know how it feels to lose a loved one by an evil murderous burglar. And he never got justice! Fucking bastard! And yes, okay, there is Zoda in the original Timeline games. Who is meh? The alien from Uma 51 ain't the same, but one thing certainly is, the Death Anchor is one of the worst machines ever crafted. Built and stolen from a Federation's missile, it has weak endurance, sensitive drifting, and a tortoise-like boost. How can a machine built from a single warhead function like that? That sneaky snake in the grass can simply drop dead! And I can even give a shit less from his megalomaniacal mutation into Hypersoda. Although it's all for naught, since he was never a Black Shadow's righteous man. Which explains why I eliminated that bastard prematurely in my fanfic series. And it was one of the positives in the bootleg English dub too. Originally Zoda, the demonic asshole that he is, was going to be the top tier hateable character. He's relatable to a murderer due to his thievery, treason to both the law and the emperor, he's a narcissistic, self-obsessed train wreck, his machine is ass, even his story mode, and he's hands down one of the worst video game and anime characters I have ever encountered. I knew it. Me. 
So who in the gaming world can possibly be worse than the psychotic mutant Zoda, the treacherous Kane, and the irritating Apparites and Execute? I'll tell you. The one character has been the bane of my miserable existence ever since I was a kid. And ever since his debut, I'd been on the hate train that never ceases. Well, he's about to be derailed. My most hateable character of all time is Quan Chi from Mortal Kombat. This asinine and diabolical Oni from Hell has always been one of my main sources of hatred for not only from the Juggernaut, but nearly my entire life. Everything this bald fuckhead has done makes me hate him more the longer he exists. It was hard to choose a combatant I despise, as there were several such as Shinnok, Shang Tsung, Dark Raiden, Shujinko, Onaga, and Damashi, and even the... Praise be to Lord Shinnok. Let us be on our... The Revenants were very, very close to being on the list, but this guy was the architect of their faithless affairs. Back when I was nine years old, I first encountered him in his true debut in the series, the episode from Defenders of the Realm, The Secret of Quan Chi. He had in a twisted copperhead sidekick, and he disguised himself as a young fugitive from Khan granting the heroes a gem. The crystallized heart of a vicious Saurian ruler which infected madness onto them upon observation. This was almost like deja vu in the prequel comic to MK4. Over time they began to tear each other apart, and only Nightwolf and Raiden weren't affected by the toxic influence. As a corrupt soul, Quan manipulated the shit out of it, and nearly killed everyone. Even when he almost murdered poor Kiba. What the fuck? I don't condone animal abusers and manipulators, especially cowards like all narcissists, when he disappeared and lived to corrode another day. Through that experience, Nightwolf became a personal favorite. Quan Chi was also a culprit on introducing the Vengeful Wrath, later used in Hanzo, which possessed Takeda and killed off Kung Lao's lover, Jennifer. He was the founder of the Brotherhood of Shadow, and innocent Serena gets thralled by him as much as Kane with gold beds, and he's the catalyst of the endless conflicts between Sub-Zero and Scorpion. You know, the never-ending bitter rivalry between the two. In case you didn't know, Quan was pulling the strings this whole time. He was the one who murdered Hanzo's family and clan, stole Shinnok's amulet for himself after hiring Bihan, and straight up lied about the massacre to the scarred Hanzo. And none of the ninjas were any more the wiser. That was until MK4. When he flat out admitted he tricked Hanzo while Kwai was unconscious, which enraged Hanzo and sent them both to the Nether Realm. It's no wonder the Ford Snake considers him as an idiotic asshole. I can't blame him. But it didn't stop there. He was responsible for Sindel's brainwashing resurrection, which emotionally scarred Kitana. He was the accomplice with Shang as they made a sneak attack on to Liu Kang and killed him, which was a preamble to his undead resume. He betrays his own race of Oni, especially Moloch and Draman. He had the goddamn audacity of manipulating each of the overlords on teaming up to obliterate the heroes before Armageddon to claim the prize in attaining Blaze's flames, granting only himself godhood. And he's never faithful to those he works with either, not even with Shang as the Deadly Alliance crumbled just before Onaga came to be. Oh, and he let the dragon claim Shinnok's amulet since he dropped it during teleportation! What the fuck? Oh, and worst of all, 
He was the main man who reanimated the corpses of the doomed combatants slaughtered by Khan and Sindel. Even reviving her twice as mindless tools of utter destruction. And scarred Iko's future. What's even more gruesome is that he's the only one who can break the thralls over his subjects. I never believed it, and I was actually happy Hanzo beheaded him, as we never saw Quan Chi again in a future title. Even so, Quan has always been the salt on all the traumatic wounds he has caused me. Just like all those other entries, Quan Chi is the personification of things I really despise in people. He's a torture, he's manipulative, he personally acts like a fucking airhead for no reason, he's a liar as worse as Biden, he's a traitor as worse as King Highland, and he traumatized me nearly all my life! And I pray to the Elder Gods he never returns in MK1! I'm the Ekron Rider, and Quan Chi has and always will be my most abhorrent character of all time. That genocidal fuckwad deserves to have his head displayed like a hunter's prize. In fact, all of those abhorrent characters on this list are just personifications of people I hate. Being obsessive, obnoxious, treacherous, crafty, emotionless, perverted, and perverted sacks of shit. I say to them all... <laughs> Fuck you! And Quan Chi, do the fans a favor. Don't you ever come back!